um, we've got here today to try to um, talk a little bit about cast iron, uh, how to select good cast iron. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot out there, and if you don't get the right stuff to do what you want to do, then it just kind of defeats the purpose and works against you. Um, I'll tell you what I do. Um, if I walk up on the table, a lot of times they'll even have a stack of pans or some pans sitting out there. Uh, the very first thing I look for to, to tell, you know, whether it's a good grade of cast or not is how thick the, the sides of the, the pan are. If the pan's real thick on the sides, I walk away from it. Um, if it's good quality steel, uh, it doesn't need to be thick. Um, so, you know, that's usually my first indicator of a newer, cheaper made pan simply because the thickness of the edges. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll, if I find one that's that's got a good thin edge, then I'll pick it up. Um, the next thing I want to do um, is run my fingers along the inside of the frying pan. And I'll kind of just close my eyes and read it like you would braille. You know, the smoother it is, uh, the better quality it is. Um, and sometimes you'll find some little surface rust and that makes it a little bit difficult. But if you're lucky, you can take a piece of cloth or something and, uh, you know, wipe the bottom and still be able to tell the, the smoothness of the bottom. Um, that's the, the second indicator. And usually if I, if I find one of those you know, or both of those with a good thin edge and a smooth bottom, and I know I've got a good pan. Uh, if you still need some convincing, uh, you can take a wooden spoon, you know, just kind of hang it from the top and tap it and listen to it. Um, the higher pitch the ring, the denser the steel, the same way a lot of guys are checking anvil. Um, but for me, that's a rule of thumb, that's what I go by. You know, now a lot of folks, they'll turn it over and they'll read the bottom, okay? There's certain names that you run across that automatically say, yeah, this is a good pan. Um, I usually don't do that because, uh, for number one, my best frying pan that, that I have has absolutely no name on the bottom of it. Uh, it's got nice raised letters. Uh, it's kind of rough casted, but it's smooth as glass on the inside, and it's good quality steel, and there's not a name on it nowhere. Um, so I, I don't want to let a name uh, tell me that, you know, whether this is good or a good pan or not. I want to be able to uh, take what I know, my experience, and uh, be able to tell by, you know, my techniques. Um, also, you'll find a lot of the times, uh, let's say Griswold, that's one of the you know, more popular names, and it's an excellent frying pan. I've got nothing in the world against Griswold. I own several myself, but you'll find a lot of people that collect Griswold, and uh, there'll be numbers that's stamped up on the, the handle of a Griswold, and they'll want to own every one in the series and all. And that's that's okay, I don't have anything against that. Um, but what that does a lot of times, it drives the price up. Um, you know, I want a good quality pan that's gonna do what I want to do uh, without cost a man arm and a leg. To me, a complete set of frying pans is uh, one for bread, because uh, that's all I do is bake bread in it. And I want one for fish, because uh, you, you can uh, taste and smell the con cross contaminants of fish. So, I want a separate one for fish, then I want a small one for everyday cooking, and then a large one for when I have a, a gathering. So for me, four pans does everything I ever want to do. Um, but uh, hopefully, you know, that'll give you an idea of what to tell as far as what's good or what's bad. Now we're going to show you what the, what, why you wondering if you see three legs on some of these pots are, and they're made for, for hearth cooking, where you, uh, you have a fireplace and you want to cook something. Just take your uh, shovel and get you some coals, pull it out of your fire, then you can take your your uh, Dutch oven with the three legs and just sit it down on top of it and you can cook. And uh, that way you've got an even cook around it. It's got plenty of air in here. So if you want to add coals, you can add them. And then you're not in the fire the whole time. And then you can also pick it up every once in a while and rotate it. And, uh, to whatever you need, if you think you need more heat on one side than other, but it and that way it cooks even. It cooks even all the way around, and um, you have different sizes. You have the small one, and you have the medium, and then you have larger ones. You can um, also get a uh, frying pans. Uh, got a frying pan with a real long handle. They call a spider uh, for cooking like that. But they're, uh, they're pretty handy as uh, well. They also have a pot like that. That's uh, it's a bean pot, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it has a moment. It's got the long handles on it. And, uh, 
Some of the ones that we've got here, these are these are pretty old that we uh, we use. And then you got some of your newer ones and stuff. But, uh, right. And and like I said, uh, that works good for hearth cooking. Um, a disadvantage will be um, if you're setting it on top of the the wood cook stove uh, because it automatically holds. Uh, you pot up off the uh, off the stove, and so you can't get direct heat when you want direct heat. Uh, so that's somewhat of a disadvantage. Uh, they work excellent over the fire um, or in an oven. You know, we we put them in the oven. Um, but like I said, that's the only disadvantage. Sometimes if we set them on top of the wood cook stove when we want to get them closer, we can't do that. All right, we're going to uh, touch base for a moment on, on some of the larger cauldrons. Um, we've got them from uh, one and a half gallon all the way up to a twenty gallon. Um, they come, even my 20 gallon, when I got it, came with a, with a handle across the top, you know, it's called a bell. But uh, anyhow, on the, the gallon and a half and, and the five gallon pots, it's not that big a deal. But when you get up into the larger pots, one thing you'll want to bear in mind is, you know, that's a lot of weight. If you take, uh, say, that 20 gallon pot that we have, for instance, um, if water weighs eight and a quarter pounds per gallon, I'm, I'm convinced that food weighs a little more, so um, just for easy mathematics, we'll say it weighs 10 pounds per gallon. So if you've got a 20 gallon pot and you fill it up, then you've got 200 pounds of food in there. Well, then that pot probably weighs 45 pounds. So then you've got 245 pounds there. Well, this is the thing. I mean, that, that pot's designed to handle that, uh, uh, that much volume and that much weight, and that's great. But when the handle comes across the top, okay, then you hook a chain in the center, um, and then all of that pressure is in, in one spot uh, on your crossbar. And then also the, the pressure, if that handle's like this, and it's being pulled in the center, it's going to be pulling that handle inward, okay, which is constantly pulling in on the sides of your pot. You know, so you got this pot that you put it on cold, and now you're getting it hot this entire time. It's got... 240 pounds of weight uh, tugging on this handle up here. Um, it's just, it's not really a good scenario. For number one, you know, it's pulling on these ears inward on these pots, and it's my opinion, that's why you find a lot of them with the ears broken on them. Uh, also, you know, if it's on a tripod, that's a different story, but, you know, we cook with a bar going across the top. You'll see later in some other video segments we're going to do. But then that, so if you've got a five foot bar and you've got the, the handles here and you've got the chain coming up in the middle and that 245 pounds is in one spot on that bar. Well, first thing we do when we get these pots, if any of them even come with handles, we take the handles off. Um, we store them in a safe place in case, you know, they're ever needed for, uh, for whatever reason. But, uh, uh, we use these and I, we, these are some chains that we hand made because we do blacksmithing too. Um, but you can use store bought chain and it'll work just as good. Uh, but if you'll take and you'll hook the chain in on each side, now rather than having 245 pounds, say, because this is only a 10 gallon pot, you know, we're referencing a 20 gallon, but rather than having 245 pounds in the center, uh, you're dividing that weight in half, which would be what, 122 and a half pounds yeah. on each side? Well, from 245 to 122 and a half, that's a, that's a huge difference. Uh, so not only is the, the pressure going straight up and down on your large pot, uh, rather than pulling uh, to the center, also on your bar going across the top, instead of having 245 pounds in one spot, now you got 122 and a half on each side, you know, and it's spread out a, a foot or so in the center. So that makes, it's easier on my crossbar, it's easier on my pot, it makes things more stable, uh, and that's, that's how we use them. One other thing we do is our bottom link, we make it removable because, now granted, it's gonna take a while to get that much volume hot, okay? But now once it gets hot, it doesn't take as much to keep it hot. So first thing we want to do is start lifting that pot. It's kind of <laughs> tough on the 250-pound but uh, We've got our top bar designed to where we can, a man can get on each side, lift it off, and just set it down on the ground. And once it's on the ground, we'll take our bottom link, and we'll just start moving it up the chain. And then we'll go back and we'll rehook our pot. So once we hang it again, we'll elevate our pot. And in my opinion, especially on open fire cooking, if... Uh, the, the biggest advantage that you can have, you know, you see a lot of stationary grates and then you'll set your cooking vessel on it, whether it's a frying pan or a Dutch oven, okay, and then it's, you've got the desired temperature you, you want and it keeps getting hotter and going farther and farther up the temperature scale. Well, the only, if your cooking vessel is locked in one position, the, um, 
only option you have as far as changing the temperature is to start spreading the coals out or messing with the fire. And the more, the more you mess with the fire, the more likely you are to put it out, okay? So ideally, you find hardwood, <clears throat> build you a, a good fire, let it burn down to a good bed of coals, because remember, the flame is good for light and, and atmosphere, but it's not really benefit you any in cooking. It's the coals that's where all your heat comes from. So uh, by being able to take your cooking vessel itself and raise and lower it to change your temperatures, um, and leaving your fire, leave it be. Uh, you'll, you'll find it to be a lot simpler to do, and uh, you know, and uh, as far as cooking and, and getting everything squared away. But anyhow, I hope that helps.